Hello everyone and a very warm welcome. My name is John Kelleher and I'm a manager within the Human Capital Consulting Team at Deloitte and I'll be your MC for today's event. On behalf of Deloitte, I'm delighted to introduce you to today's session that we're proud to be sponsoring. This afternoon, we'll be discussing a really interesting topic of vulnerability in the workplace. We have for you a really strong panel who will each share their thoughts on how to cope with vulnerability in the workplace and how employers can prevent it from happening and help to manage it. So I do hope you enjoy. This webinar will touch on some sections of society that are vulnerable and require additional support and accommodation in the ways they work. If done correctly, this can create a win-win for both the company and the employee. Components we will discuss will include those with disabilities, neurodiversity, those experiencing imposter syndrome, age, authenticity, and returning to work at different stages of our lives. It is true return to work that we can all share an understanding of vulnerability in the workplace as the recent pandemic has forced us to ask many questions of the future of work for both ourselves and our organizations. So to begin today, I'd love to invite the panel to introduce themselves. And if we could please begin with you, Karen. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Karen O'Reilly, and I'm the founder of Employ Mum and Employ Flex. So Employ Mum was founded uh, back in 2016 when I myself came back from living abroad for 20 years. Uh, my husband was still working abroad and I had two small kids and wanted to be around because they were moving from a French school to an Irish school. So I um, was looking for flexibility. So a job, I really wanted to work. I had 20 years experience, I'm a qualified accountant. And uh, when I started looking for work, I realized there was nobody out there to help me find flexible work. And there was nobody talking about flexible work back then. So with a bit of research, I discovered that there was over 400,000 women who stated their role as home duties in Ireland. This is opposed to 9,000 men. So I realized that there was an awful lot of women just like me Again, qualified, skilled, experienced, who really wanted to work, but just wanted to work flexibly. flexibly. And so then Employ Mum was born. As in 2019, then we set up Employ Flex and to open it up to everybody in the workplace, because it's not just parents who are looking for flexibility. It's also um, women without children and, and men as well, you know, looking for flexibility in the workplace. So we are primarily a recruitment agency. We find uh, flexible work for our candidates. Uh, we also offer training, and we do workshops, uh, we have a flexible work audit, we go into companies and see how they can be more flexible. We help companies with their female participation rates, and we have a panel of coaches who support us to help women return to the workplace or uh, pivot in their careers. So that's us in a nutshell. Uh, we speak to women every day um, about the challenges they face in the workplace. So. We're in a good place to speak about vulnerability, um, the vulnerability of women in the workplace. Uh, so we're delighted to be here today and thank you very much for the invitation. We're very looking forward to this. Thank you, Karen. Kirabeth, I'd now like to invite you to introduce yourself. So uh, I'm Kirabeth, I'm 22 years old and I'm just finishing my final year of psychology and computer science in UCC. Um, but I'm probably better known in kind of this sphere as an autism advocate and the founder and creator of My Contact, which is an app to help people with autism learn to make and maintain eye contact in a way that's comfortable for them on their own terms. So I'm kind of uh, exploring just the uh, starting end of a career as a person with a disability. And I'm very excited to be here to have a chat with everybody. Thank you so much, Kira Beth. Laura, I'll invite you to introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Laura Guckian. I am an accredited and qualified life coach for mums, and I am the founder of Mind Mummy Coaching. But most importantly, I am mum to three little people. Um, so where Mind Mummy Coaching was born from, essentially, was my own experience of motherhood. I had an extremely challenging first couple of years where essentially my life almost fell apart. And I remember thinking at the time, why is nobody talking about all these parts of motherhood and why is nobody helping us? So it was sort of in that moment I decided I'm gonna be that person. So fast forward a few years later, I left the world of corporate marketing, trained as a life coach and set up Mind Mommy Coaching. So what Mind Mommy Coaching aims to do is first of all, normalize all of the challenges we feel as mums, helping us speak out about it, helping break down that stigma and making us feel less alone. 
and also helping moms navigate those challenges so that they achieve mental health well-being. And I do that in a number of ways. I suppose I do it through one-to-one -one client coaching. I do it through workshops. I do it through working with corporates in terms of doing talks like this or doing specific workshops. So I can honestly say for the first time in my life, I have never been happier. And while I still have all of the challenges that go with motherhood, I now have the tools to navigate them and I feel fulfilled and I feel like a sense of meaning and I feel like my purpose in life now is to do that for other moms. So today I am going to be talking a little bit about how moms feel vulnerable in the workplace and maybe steps moms can take to feel better and steps that maybe organizations can, can take to, to make them feel more supported. So yeah, really looking forward to it. Thank you all, and I'm really looking forward to gathering your insights. But I think we should begin by setting the scene and consider what we mean when we speak of vulnerability in the workplace, and indeed what the associated components um, that we must pay diligence to um, in order to fully to understand the importance of recognizing and mitigating against the risks um, experienced by employees who may feel vulnerable at work. So traditionally, when we speak of vulnerability in the workplace, we often mistake it for weakness or fragility, when indeed, in fact, it, it is anything but that. Vulnerability in the workplace is experienced by all of us at different stages of our lives, whether you're starting a new job, returning to work post-maternity leave, received a big promotion, wondering if reasonable accommodation will be appropriate to your disability, and will I have to return to the office full-time? I've no doubt this is starting to sound very familiar to you all. So in essence, vulnerability in the workplace is about recognizing and creating an environment where employees can express and expose in words and behavior who they really are, what they genuinely feel, need, and think at work. So whilst unmasking and showing our authentic selves can be hard in all aspects of our lives, lives, it's particularly difficult in our professional lives, where there's often an expectation to keep a friendly but cool distance with our colleagues, and also project an area, an era of confidence and fallibility, you know, which is deeply in, entrenched within our own belief systems in the workplace. So to begin, we will look at what the benefits of encouraging employees to be vulnerable at work are. And our panelists today will leave you with no doubt of the benefits of bringing our so-called full selves to work. And with key outcomes of doing so, including better quality output and more fulfilled employees. Being able to reveal the breadth of our human experience, whether that is you're struggling as a parent, have a mental health issue, or overwhelm in a new role, have all been tied to enhanced feelings of self-worth, increased creativity, innovation, and deeper relationships all which benefit us on a personal level and a professional level. So essentially, when employees show up as their authentic selves, they will show up as their best selves. Um, so those are perceived benefits. But from an employee's perspective, there are certainly some risks to exposing our emotions at work, such as rejection or of ideas, criticism about how we perform, ostracization for not fitting in, all possible consequences. Doubling down on this are the fears of being labelled, reprimanded, all which greatly impact the degree of willingness that we have to show our feelings or even to offer the unconventional conventional views that we often experience or, or present. Additionally, what can be considered to be appropriate sharing in one forum can be, can be considered as too much information in another forum and predisposing us to, to judgment or gossip. So we can't speak about vulnerability in the workplace without speaking about culture. We can't detach one from the other. And to be vulnerable in the workplace, employee, employers need to create psychologically safe environments where there's a focus on belief that vulnerability won't impact your, your life at work in, an, in a negative way. Creating psychological safety is crucial for organizations attempting to create the right environment for allowing our employees to be vulnerable. And this psychological safety needs to be embedded in our group dynamics, Employees and employers must respect the uniqueness of each individual in the workplace. We must, have, we must have practices to support vulnerability. And indeed, we must provide employees with resources and information, um, allowing them to be vulnerable in the workplace. Because a key aspect of vulnerability in the workplace is creating the environment and actually allowing people to be vulnerable in the workplace. So now that we understand our benefits, understand the risks, and know what type of environment we need to create, it, what is the answer? You know, how do we support and allow our employees to be vulnerable at work? And at Deloitte, we view this as being inclusive leadership. So the core aspects of leadership, such as setting direction and influencing, those will be timeless. But we see inclusive leadership as being vital to the way leadership is executed to promote and create a workplace where employees can indeed show up as their best and authentic selves. And across the spectrum of inclusive leadership, we've identified six, I suppose, signature traits. Um, from left to right, you will see, number one, cognizance, um, in that a recognition that a bias of a leader 
um, is often the athlete's heel of a leader and can make your employees feel vulnerable at work. Curiosity, because the best leaders recognize that different ideas and experiences enable growth and allow their employees to be vulnerable at work. Cultural intelligence, because not everyone sees the world through the same lens and that different viewpoint can allow people to be vulnerable at work and create diverse thinking teams. Commitment, because inclusive leaders are committed to creating a workplace where employees can show up as their best and authentic selves, allowing them to be vulnerable. Encourage, because leaders who role model and show their own vulnerability at the same time are creating an environment where employees can do the same. And finally then, collaboration, because the diverse nature of vulnerability experienced by employees is experienced by us all and can feed into strengthening the group dynamic and strengthening the culture of the organization. But enough from me, what I'd love to do now is to move on and speak to our panelists and gather our insights from each of them. So Karen, I'm going to begin with you. Through Employee Flex and Employee Mum, you frequently speak about the challenges that are faced by women in the workplace and the vulnerability associated with being a woman in the workplace. So from your perspective, what are the key components um, that lead women to becoming vulnerable at work and what can we do to decrease this vulnerability? Thanks, John. And that was a great introduction there. And it's it's just fantastic to hear that Deloitte are, are so inclusive and aware of vulnerability in the workplace. Um, it's just music to our ears, really, to hear one of the big four embracing all of this, you know. So uh, kudos to, to Deloitte. Um, yeah, look, we speak to women every day um, who contact us. We are, we're kind of seen as a safe place for them to talk as, as opposed to traditional um, recruitment agencies. Um, so like, we 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 spoke spoken to women who have hidden the fact that they have children when they when they go to to go for jobs, you know, with traditional agencies, you know. So this is called secret parenting when they actually don't admit that they have children or hide the fact that they have children or hide the fact that they are planning to get pregnant or hide the fact that um, you know that they might that Johnny might have um, a, a dentist appointment next week, etc. You know, so. But the fact that this, you know, phrase secret parenting even exists really is a very sad um, reflection of the workplace in, in many cases. Um, but I suppose where women do feel vulnerable is when the culture of, an or of a workplace um, is, is not in aligned with them. Uh, you know, there can be a culture of presenteeism where they're expected to, to be there, well, you know, whether that's at home or, you know, to be on call all the time. So we, we talk to women who were just coming to us and they're saying, look, this is just completely unsustainable. My, my workplace expects me to do 60, 70 hours a week. They expect me to be always there, always on call. Um, you know, I have got three children. I, I, I just can't do this anymore. You know, um, so that, that, that situation really is, is just so sad for us to hear. And unfortunately, these stories come from companies who are actually flying the flag for flexibility and inclusivity. Um, but we're hearing completely different stories coming from candidates. So it's really important we feel that co you know companies are authentic in their offering. You know, and the word on the street does get out, and people do know what it is like to work in toxic workplaces. So it is the authentic workplaces who are truly offering flexibility, who are empathetic, who are um, inclusive. They're the companies who are going to, uh, you know, attract the best talent going forward. Uh, we did a survey there recently and we asked, um, we had about um, 750 people responded to it and they said that one of the questions was, all things being equal, uh, would you change jobs if more flexibility was offered in another role? And 93% of people said they would. So this goes to show you that flexibility is the number one thing that you know people want in the workplace at the moment. So companies offering that authentically, I think that's the important word. And you mentioned it yourself there about bringing your authentic self to work. That's one side of it, but the companies need to be authentic too. Um, now look at the new EU directive on work-life balance, which is coming in in October 2022, um, will allow carers to have the right to request flexible work in the workplace. So this is a real positive step in the right direction, but we would hope that we, we would imagine, we, we predict that it will be mostly women who will look for this. And what our hope is that women's careers won't be punished for uh, going for the flexible work option. So careers shouldn't be, you shouldn't be punished for opting for the flexible work option, which is we're seeing quite a lot as well. So again, companies need to be aware of that. Um, you know, if, if the person is working part-time, that doesn't mean that their career should be um, part-time. 
you know, just because they're working part time just means they're working for fewer hours. So there's a lot of things that companies need to really think through as we navigate our way in this new way of working. And um, yeah, it's um, yeah, we, we just hope that, you know, women did suffer a lot during COVID um, in the workplace and they were trying to juggle it all. Um, so we hope now going forward, we have a chance now to get it right going forward. Um, and I think the companies who are doing that are the ones who are going to to really um, to really benefit. Thanks, Karen, for, for a great opener. Um, very, very insightful um, and, and some great points there too. I'd like to just focus in on our hiding one's vulnerability and flexibility, which I believe would bring us directly to you, Carabet, and your area of expertise. So you're the finder of the My Contact app, and in doing so, you work closely with those with an array of disabilities. Can you give us an insight to a specific challenge that was common among the group as a whole, um, a challenge that they may have been looking to hide or a challenge that prevented them from um, getting their desired flexibility in the workplace and indeed made them vulnerable? Um, first of all, uh, it's always really interesting to hear, uh, Karen, uh, what you're speaking about, and I'm really looking forward to hearing more about uh, Laura's work as well, because um, these are realms that are so far out of what's familiar to me because I'm actually the stage of life I'm at is a lot closer to the child that the parent is looking for time off for as opposed to the parent looking for the time off. Um, I'm always really reluctant to speak for people with disabilities as a whole because our needs are very diverse but based on personal experience um, the last few months have been just chaotic because in my day-to-day -day life I am confident about the fact I am autistic and when, when I say that I don't mean that I'm going around parading it everywhere I go but I'm also not hiding it. I'm engaging in my special interests even if they seem childish to people who are outside of my little bubble of people who are familiar with me. Um, I'm not afraid to specify if you are asking me to do something you need to ask me directly because I don't pick up on subtle social cues and um, and in university I was never afraid to go to a lecture and say I need extra time because I have ADHD and as such I'm reliant on medication which only give me x amount of hours in a day that I can actually be productive but now I'm just at the start of looking for jobs looking for graduate programs and for the first time in a long time I'm sitting on this end of the computer going, they say that they're not going to discriminate based on gender and disability, but how do I know? Because at the end of the day, everybody has these secret biases. We all have them um, based on previous experiences, based on what we've been taught. Um, and we still have this culture, particularly with autism, where we don't really acknowledge that autistic adults exist and that we're just as much an adult as anybody else we just have slightly different interests and slightly different needs and um, for a long time I used to say that I uh, have days where I'm at the equivalent mindset of a six-year-old I don't I have every day is a day where I'm at the mind of a 22 year old autistic person which looks different to a neurotypical brain so it's really that issue of you're sitting on the edge this end of the computer going, if I get this job, they're going to have to know. There, there is no way I could do this job if they didn't know because I'm going to need accommodations, be it uh, physical accommodations to get into a building, be it uh, kind of sensory accesses such as, you know, being able to have text to speech technology, be it flexible working hours. In my case, if a company wants me to do my best work, it's in their best interest to let me start at eight in the morning let me take a break around 12 for about two hours and let me come back at two to finish out the day. Um, and a lot of companies don't advertise these things. They say, and it's a little bit weird because they put these statements saying, oh, we won't discriminate, but they also don't put evidence of these are the supports. Uh, when a person with a disability is looking at a job, we're not like, lack of discrimination shouldn't be the bar. It shouldn't be where the bar is set. And that sounds harsh, but it's the truth. Uh, lack of discrimination should not be the bar. The bar should be, you will be able to thrive in this job, not just survive. And here's how we're going to support you in doing it. 
Thank you so much, Claire Beth. Um, incredibly interesting, which I think sets the, the scene up very nicely for, for Laura, as, as I think Laura, well, what both Karen and Claire Beth have been speaking about aligns with what you, you often see in, in your own area of work. Uh, for us, can you elaborate further from your own insights to the challenges that they speak about? Um, and I suppose identify how we can be more supportive um, of those who, who may be vulnerable in our workplaces. Yeah, wow, well, what a start, Kira and, and Kira Beth and Karen, like really good insights there. I suppose what, what I want to share is something quite interesting on my Instagram page. So I've almost 8,000 mums that follow me on that. And I did a survey recently asking them straight out, have you ever felt vulnerable in the workplace? And up to 95% of them. So there was close to a thousand people that voted. It was on one of those polls. 95% of them said yes. So I then tried to dig it down a bit and say, well, in what ways did you feel vulnerable? Or I suppose, what does vulnerability mean to you? And there was a couple of things. So I'm going to try and kind of categorize them. And I think we're going to see a lot of overlap here. The first thing that was cropping out and it was kind of screaming out was this pressure. I suppose the way they describe it is pressure to compensate for time when they can't be there. So for example, if they have to pick up a sick kid, if like what I can relate to, to Kira Beth is saying there, like my little boy has recently been diagnosed with autism. And while I don't have a disability, that requires him to go to appointments regularly. Um, and if I wasn't self-employed, how would we navigate that? So there's all different dynamics. That means a mum might not be in, able to be in the office nine to five, Monday to Friday. So it was the pressure to kind of compensate for that last time. It was kind of what Karen was alluding to there, like it was almost the punishment for being a mum. And what Kira Beth was saying, while companies will openly say we don't discriminate, a lot of these mums were saying I was overlooked for a promotion while I was on maternity leave and it was given to someone with less experience and less time with the organisation. It should have been my job. So that was coming through. And that sort of lends itself to another key piece was they just don't feel confident anymore. So like if you're looking around and you're feeling this pressure to overwork and you're blatantly seeing that promotions are giving away to people that maybe don't have the credentials as you it's going to impact your confidence so mums are left feeling extremely vulnerable in that I can't do my job that leads to impacts then like procrastination not feeling like they can do it um, and then that was leading to this massive piece that mums will experience anyway but this piece around the guilt for being in the workplace so I shouldn't be working and this is kind of formed by that false narrative around what a good mom should do. A good mom does not work 40 hours a week. A good mom should be at home. You shouldn't be here. So that's constantly playing on their mind where they can't feel like they can give their full attention to their job. So it was a real mix of things. But in terms of an organization, if I was to say, what could they do to support a mom or even a parent? It's back to what Karen was saying. Like the number one thing is flexibility and what Kira Beth was saying. If you can trust in your team to know that they have the ability to do this job and do it well, but they need to do it in their own time and in their own space, they're going to thrive. The organization is going to thrive. The days of having a strict nine to five office job where you're sitting at your desk are gone. Um, if we've learned anything from COVID, it's that. So the number one thing is flexibility. But when you're looking at mums in particular, I think it is the support they need from I suppose, pregnancy right through to returning to work after maternity leave. And I would help a lot of organizations do this in terms of working with them during pregnancy, maybe linking back in with them on maternity leave and then helping them integrate back into their role. Because the reality is, as moms, when we become moms, we do change mentally and physically. But that doesn't mean we can't do our job. In fact, it means we're probably better able to do it from what we've learned. So it's the flexibility, it's giving better support during pregnancy, maternity and integrating back in. And it's also, which I'll talk later on about, it's building a culture that really encourages you to recognize your strengths and celebrates you using your strengths. And that will make a little bit more sense in a minute. But that's something I think, particularly in Ireland, we're not good at doing. So that's what I would take from my insights. But I'm, I'm really interested to hear more about it. Thank you all. That, that's an incredible opening round. Um, I think from an audience perspective, you know, even if we were to cut the webinar now, we, like you've given so much insight from the perspective of, you know, how employees can feel vulnerable in the workplace. You know, some, some key teams that I've already identified from there is those hiding their vulnerability, the requirement for flexibility, you know, those in the workplace who believe they have to actually compensate for being in a, a certain personal circumstance or having vulnerabilities. Navigating the, the complex terrain that is the workplace, confidence or lack thereof, and the guilt that can be associated uh, 
with being vulnerable. And I suppose to look at it from the other side of the coin, from an organizational perspective, okay, um, I'm going to come back to you, Karen, and talk about support. Um, so building on what we've spoken about already and given the insights that we just received um, and my earlier reference to inclusive leadership, how do you believe vulnerability should be embraced at work and how can leaders create that environment, um, I suppose, to foster an environment of where employees can show up as their best and authentic selves? Yeah, uh, well, look, um... Uh, lovely, uh, lovely to hear from the from uh, Kira and Laura there, and I totally agree with all you have to say as well. Um, look, I think vulnerability um, is is kind of got is like a dirty word, and um, it should shouldn't really be seen as a negative thing. Uh, I think it's quite good to be vulnerable in the workplace, uh, and that's something that should be embraced, uh, particularly from leaders. You know, um, if if a leader can show that they are vulnerable, um, you know. Particularly in the last few years, I think, you know, as we all tried to figure out um, COVID, um, leaders didn't know what was going to happen next and, and we all didn't know what was going to happen next. So I think the leaders who put up their hand and said, hey guys, you know what, we're, 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 we need to figure this out together. You know, I don't know what's going to happen and um, we, we, we'll, we'll try and get, get, get the most positive outcome, but let's all work together. And, and if you have any suggestions, please come to me with them, you know. So opening up that conversation and showing that, you know what, I'm human as well and I don't know everything is a really good message to hear from, from leaders. Um, and look, we're all about solutions here in Employ Moment, Employ Flex and, um, and keeping women in the workplace. Um, you know, what, what we call the, the, the female mum brain drain that happens and, and, mem and, you know, so many women are being forced out of the workplace because they just cannot continue and find it completely unsustainable. Um, so to keep women in the workplace, uh, there's a lot of things that co companies can do. Um, again, leading with empathy, um, offering returnships, and something that Kira said there, which I think was very important, was the messaging that companies have is really, really important. So if Kira is looking for a job at the moment now, and mom's looking for jobs at the moment, they, they go on the company's website and their social media, and they click around and see, what, what is this company like, and would I like to work here? If there isn't a strong message coming from that company to say, you know, we welcome everybody, you know, this is our program for women, this is our program for mums, we have a maternity charter, we'll support you when you're coming back to work, you know, we'll support you if you have any disability, um, you know, we're very inclusive, we, we want to talk to you, we want a diverse workplace. If they're not saying that in their messaging, here isn't going to apply. A mom with three kids isn't going to apply. You know, so it's really important for companies to get that right, um, you know, and, and have role models on their website and on their social media that reflect everybody within the organization, not just the men in suits. You know, so you go on like this is very true in male dominated um, organizations or male dominated industries. We just take engineering, for example. And we, we get a lot of engineering companies to us saying, look, we've got 5% female participation. Like, what can we do? Like. You go onto their website and it's all men and you're going like, and there's nothing about, you know, diversity or, you know, female inclusion or, you know, inclu inclusivity in general. And we're saying, well, why would a woman apply here? And you look at their job specs and they're five pages long with loads of jargon and you go, you need help here because you're scaring away half the population. Because if a woman looks at a job spec and they can't do everything that's on that list, they're not going to apply. And if you've got five pages of a job spec, with all internal jargon on it, that woman isn't going to apply like, you know, so it's not about dumbing down the job specs, but it's about making them more inclusive and using apps like Textio to take out any bias that might be in, in, in the job specs. So it's, again, I come back to authentic, authenticity in the workplace and authentic, I'd say that word, being authentic um, in, in your offering and in what you're saying. Um, I think, you know, all of that, that will, will bring and keep everybody in the workplace and level the playing field rather than pushing people out or not attracting them in the first place. I think I went a bit off, off subject there. No, not at all, Karen. Thanks so much. And, and I think um, we'll go to you next, Kira Bess. Um, so Karen has just spoken about companies getting it right, being inclusive and um, removing bias. And I suppose my next question to you was, how can companies do that? How can they make the workplaces more attractable um, and accessible? to nor diverse candidates? But a question also popped up in um, the questions box. And from a DNI perspective, you know, what could be done to 
entice you know those with disabilities to actually apply to roles and um, does it begin at the interview stage through real life testimonials blogs videos etc and um, how could employers entice those who are feeling vulnerable um, into their workplaces and um, it's a really good question and karen raised an awful lot of really relevant points there uh, the, the first thing I'll say is I, I agree with Karen. If, if you're giving me a five page job spec, you've lost me at page two. You, you just have. Um, a, a big thing for me is it's one thing to say you're doing things. And you can have the best of intentions. And maybe it's something that you've tried to get up. Maybe it's a program you tried to get up and running and you're advertising it and it's not really working properly. Um, it's really important to be upfront with your candidates about what you reasonably can and can't accommodate. Uh, I would much rather on day one of the interview sit down and hear, look, we can meet this, this and this accommodation. You're going to have to meet us halfway with this one. It's just not feasible because it gives me a much better picture of a, OK, they're not just not meeting accommodations. There's a reason they can't meet that. How can I meet them halfway? And it also means that if that accommodation is a deal breaker for me, if it's something that's the difference between me being able to participate and me not being able to participate, I, I can then make a decision. It empowers me to make a decision about how I want to proceed. Uh, I, I'm finding with a lot of graduate programs at the moment. Interestingly, in software engineering, there is definitely a men in suits problem. Uh, definitely one there. But there's also kind of a little bit of a what I would refer to as a try hard problem. Where it becomes clear once I start dealing with an organization that they have three or four women advertised on their website and it looks like they may be the only three or four women in the organization. So I, I would say just be very careful when you're advertising diversity. Like the diversity should match. So if you got a picture of four people and your ratio is roughly you know two to every four men but that is reflected in the imagery i know a sorry to interrupt carabeth your uh, microphone seems to be dropping program stage is if we had the option to maybe kind of instead of starting throwing us in the deep end day one if we had a chance to kind of integrate a little bit more slowly into the workplace because that's a big transition um and even if you're not autistic that is a big transition going from college where okay your hand isn't you're not being spoon-fed but you've got some level of uh, external input on okay this is the direction you're going keep going uh, to the workplace of trying to figure out a whole new culture, a whole new group of people, trying to figure out, you know, what your own job is. Because let, let's be honest, a lot of jobs have five or six different things that you need to actually do. So I, I think it's one of those things of kind of working out an adjustment period. Um, attracting neurodiverse candidates happens earlier than the interview stage. I decide based on what I have seen of an organization previously, be it at recruitment fairs, be it on their websites, be it on their LinkedIn pages. Um, it, it doesn't cut it for me for organizations to say, we don't discriminate. Um, I, I need to see that you have put some sort of action into place to try and include people, even if it's not to include people specifically with my type of disability, but that you're open to either making it more accessible to people with a physical disability or people with a sensory disability or parents or people who have never worked before or people who have taken a career break and are now coming back just seeing that you're taking some sort of action to create opportunity for people to thrive that is what i am looking for in any organization is effectively we're not just saying we're trying we're actually trying here's the example show me don't tell me Thank you so much, Kara Best. Um, and coming back to you, Laura, given the detail we've just received on inclusive leadership and I suppose the practical tips um, that employers can uh, apply and um, that we receive from, from Kara Best, we have a good understanding of how we can embrace vulnerability and entice employees into the workplace. And um, from your perspective, I'd like to look at it uh, through a different lens and I suppose move away from the graduate or the entry into the workplace and look at returning to work. 
And what advice or support would you give to anybody returning to work after a prolonged period of time where they believe the workplace may have changed? And, you know, when I speak to people returning to work, I'm talking about us all post-pandemic mm. or indeed a, a female post maternity leave. Yeah, and I think that's really key that, yes, while I work with mums, this can be applied to anyone. So a lot of the mums that come to me will come saying, oh, I'm about to return to work. I'm really nervous about it. And, you know, and when we start working on it, what I say is look at what you can control. Right. So we can talk about this all day here about what we feel the challenges are in an organization. But I can't change an organization. But what I can do as an individual is I can control what's around me. OK, so we do a lot of work with mums around, first of all, how do you get balance in your life? And that's a word that's battled about a lot. But what I mean by that is imagine a stool, right? Imagine a stool has four legs and your career is one leg. And maybe if we use an example of a mum, motherhood is another leg. If we just focus on your career and motherhood and how you can make improvements there, your stool is still going to be off balance because the other two legs might be you know, your social and fun or the relationships in your life or your mental health and well-being or your personal growth or anything. So we have to look at all elements of your life, make sure you have clarity on what's going on in my life right now, what aspects am I happy with, what aspects am I not happy with, so that you have more balance in your life. And if you have more balance, you will generally feel better physically and mentally. And what will happen is you will have feel better equipped to navigate any challenges you might be facing at work. So that's the first thing. It's like, try not to focus on what you're going back into because a large part of that you can't control. Focus on what you can control. And then that leads on to the second part. So this might sound really obvious, but what practical things can you do? So if you're returning to work either after COVID or mat leave or whatever it might be, what are the practical things? What are the conversations that need to happen? So do you need childcare? What kind of childcare is it? Have you set boundaries? Have you an agreement in place? If the child is sick, what happens? With your partner, have you a schedule? Like my partner and I, my husband and I, we have a schedule that if the kids are sick this week. Who's going to take them? So although the situation is out of your control to a large extent, you're taking back the control. What's going to happen if this happens? The third piece is around organization, which again sounds very simplified, but I help mums really with this. It's about we're time poor. And even if you're not a mum, we're time poor. So how can we look at the things we're doing in a day, almost do an analysis on it and go, what do I need to do? What do I want to do? And what are the things I'm only doing because I feel pressure to do or I feel I should do? And again, that can be applied in a professional setting as well. We need to get rid of the things we feel pressure to do or that we should do so that we're using our time more efficiently. And the fourth thing to talk about, which is relevant to mums, but it's relevant to dads too, is navigating that guilt that guilt for I shouldn't be here, I should be doing this, I should be doing that. So guilt is essentially a belief. It's a self-limiting belief we have around doing something equals X, Y, or Z. So at mom guilt, it's if I do this, I'm a good mom. So I do a lot of work with moms and how do we navigate that mom guilt? How do we change that mindset? So that essentially you're going back into work where you feel your life is balanced. You have all four legs on the floor. You feel stable, you feel strong. You've done the practical things. You feel you're more organized and that guilt that is eroding your brain is gone. You know how to manage it. So that's really, if you're going to take one thing, look at what you can control, not what you can't control. Thanks so much, Laura. Um, and we have a question in, in the comments box in relation to remote working. So I'm going to come to you, Karen, and just ask you, how can we identify vulnerable people in the workplace, in particular when we're working remotely or in a hybrid environment? How can employers support this? And indeed, as employers, do we need a change in mindset to shift our focus towards not just identifying vulnerability in our physical workplaces, but also in the virtual workspace? Yeah, I suppose this comes back to, um, you know, leading with empathy that we spoke about earlier and, um, you know, those those soft skills that are often overlooked in leaders um, are, are were always important, but are even more important now as we are working remotely and working in a hybrid situation. Um, so, as you said, when we're working remotely, it, it is more difficult to identify somebody who is vulnerable. Um, so, you know, in an office environment, you physically see them, you're, you're, you, you know, might pop your head into their office or, you know, check in on them regularly. Um, but if you're working remotely, uh, you know, if you're on meetings and you're not, you know, they mightn't have their camera on, etc. It's very hard to to see and feel, get the feel of, of somebody who, who is a, may, may be vulnerable. So it's really important for leaders to, to tune in 
you know, to look for signs of burnout. Um, because I suppose this is one of the things, I suppose this is the ironic thing about remote working, like um, pre-COVID um, co companies used to always say, look, our, our staff aren't going to be as productive if they're working remotely and we can't trust them to get the work done. But actually the opposite is true because people seem to work longer hours. Uh, they're more productive, but they're also at risk of burnout because there's very little separation between their work and their, their home life. So look for those signs of burnout, you know, check that when, when are people logging in? Are they logging in, you know, for, um, and doing really long days? Or are they logging in at three o'clock in the morning and funny hours like that? And make sure that they are separating their life from, from their work. Um, check, checking in regularly with your, with your people. I'd say you would do that organically in the office. Um, but I suppose it's really important to do that now um, on a, maybe a quick one to one with um, somebody if they're working 100 percent remotely, um, you know, and again, back to the authenticity, um, you know, how are you doing like, you know, and how, how are you getting on like and is everything OK? You know, ask those leading questions like and um, try to be you know, and try to have an open door policy uh, where people can feel that they can, you know, remotely or or in the office and, you know, knock on your door and say, look, you know, I have a problem. I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed. You know, life does throw curveballs at us at a certain stage. You know, um, we all, everybody is going to be throwing curveballs during their working life. And it's up to the managers then to recognize those times and to be more flexible and to be more compassionate and empathetic in their leadership. So, so checking in with them regularly is, is really important. And, um, and, and I suppose learning listening skills, you know, for a lot of leaders, they, they you know, they may be, um, they have, may have risen to the top because they're, they're brilliant at what they do probably, you know, but they may not have ever developed their listening skills. You know, they may be more of the, the talker. So, you know, I would encourage companies to, um, you know, help leaders with their listening skills and, and, and for them to listen um, proactively uh, and, 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 um, and, and get feedback from, from your, um, from your staff regularly as well. That could be anonymous as well. You know, if you, if you, um, if people are not inclined to say things personally, if they're, you know, could be introverted or feeling particularly vulnerable. So if you do anonymous surveys, like a, a lot of companies who are remote first will get feedback every week from their staff, like um, Doist and, and companies like that. So, so getting anonymous feedback is sometimes a really good way just to, to test the waters and see how everybody's doing. But yeah, just uh, they, they'd be my main tips, like just tuning in and, and listening, listening hard. Thanks, Karen. Um, fantastic uh, practical tips. And I, I'd be interested to hear you elaborate on this care that. So I suppose true finding in my contact app, you help those on the autism spectrum to overcome their vulnerabilities. Um, so what transferable tips can you give us, um, particularly in this new world of work um, where we work remotely um, or in a hybrid manner? And um, that would help, I suppose, those who feel vulnerable in the workplace uh, to overcome social isolation, which, which I know is getting um, quite a lot of attention to feel the vulnerability at the moment. I think, interestingly, I think a big part of the solution come, boils down to kind of accommodations benefit everyone. So if we remove needing a label, in order to be able to access accommodation. So instead of me having to put my hand up and say, hey, I'm autistic, I need to use noise cancelling headphones when I'm working independently at my desk, just making that available, making that an option, making that an accepted norm in the office automatically makes me feel less isolated because I'm not the different one. I grew up being the weird kid and a lot of autistic people have the same feeling where for a, particularly if you're diagnosed a little bit later, for years you didn't know why you were different, but you knew you were. You knew you didn't fit. And obviously there are some accommodations that you can't just hand out to everybody. Um, but those are actually pretty few. When you actually sit back and examine accommodations as a whole, the whole idea is that they're meant to be reasonable. So why are we making people jump through loads of hoops to access them? particularly when the people who are asking to jump through hoops are already jumping through hoops to get to a point where they can ask if they can jump through hoops. Generally speaking, social isolation in the workplace is really difficult to address. Uh, for me, partially because I have not been in a workplace, so I am not quite as familiar with the subject, but a lot of the time it's just about 
fostering a sense of inclusion and diversity and inclusion have become buzzwords in the corporate world recently. But I think because they've become buzzwords, they've started to lose a sense of meaning. D diversity and inclusion is very important. Do not get me wrong. This is not me saying don't diversify and don't include. That, that's not what this message is. But it's just to sit down and actually reflect, well, what policies do we have in place that are actually just barriers and that aren't actually benefiting anybody? Because every workplace has at least one. I, I guarantee you, if you sit down and actually look at your office policies, there are unnecessary ones there that are just limiting people to, in terms of how included they feel and how accessible the workplace feels to them. So for a lot of, from my perspective, a lot of inclusion comes from if I can't access the space and if when I can access the space, I feel like I stick out, I feel like I'm the odd one out, that's automatically putting a major barrier into inclusion. Um, I, I don't really feel fully qualified to give a better answer to that question. I think that's the best, uh, the best option I can give. Sounds like a, a really good answer to me, Carabetta, and no doubt the, the audience and the rest of the panel share that um, sentiment. Uh, just conscious of the time, um, I think we have time for one more question um, for our panel, but I would just invite the audience to drop any questions you may have in the Q&A box um, and we'll get to them um, in, the, in the last five to seven minutes of the presentation or of the webinar indeed. So I'm going to finish up with you um, for the time being, Laura. Um, and finish with a question in relation to, to confidence. Um, so much of thought leadership in academia around vulnerability shows a correlation with vulnerability and increased levels of confidence. Very interested to hear your perspective as to how we can help those suffering vulnerability in the workplace develop and enhance their own confidence. Yeah, and this is a really, really important one. And I think I mentioned it at the start, increasing your confidence when it sounds so basic is all about embracing your strengths. And here's an example that will help you, I suppose, understand that. So imagine you're a sailboat, right? And there's lots of research on this from positive psychology. Imagine you're a sailboat and let's say that sailboat has a leak. Let's call that leak your weakness. So while you can't ignore your weakness because you're going to sink, you have to fix that. So even if you give two days fixing that leak, it's not going to make the boat move forward. It's just going to make the boat stay afloat. But let's say, assume your sails are your strengths, right? The sails are what are ultimately going to drive you forward. They're what's going to help you reach your full potential, help you find meaning. That's your strength. You need to give attention to the sails. So if you look at it in that way, what I'm going to say next is going to make sense. So remember, your leak is your weakness. While you give it time and fix it, it's never going to move the boat. Your sails are your strengths. If we embrace them, if we celebrate them and we use them, we're going to move forward. So even if we feel vulnerable, for whatever reason, be that a disability, be it that we're a mum, we can't ignore the potential or perceived weakness, but we have to celebrate our each and unique strengths. And in Ireland in particular, there's a number of reasons why we find it hard to, I suppose, recognise our strengths and lean into them. And one is, I suppose, sometimes the problem can seem more urgent. So if you have a boat leaking, you're going to jump to that, aren't you? You're going to go, oh my God, the boat is leaking. I have to fix the leak. So it feels more urgent. And also I think particularly in Ireland, society kind of dictates that we keep some sense of modesty. You know, that piece of, oh, you look lovely today. Oh, this whole thing, that's a real Irish thing. We need to have a culture where we're really celebrating and embracing strengths in a positive way. Um, the third, which is what a lot of moms come to me, we don't always know what our strengths are. You know, if I asked you to name five strengths now, you might go, oh, yeah, I know that. But do you really? So, you know, a key way to identify a strength is really tune into like what makes me come alive. If someone is talking about a strength, they'll just have an energy about them and a presence and they'll feel confident. So like what's your energy coming from? Energy is a hallmark of your strength. It's a burst of energy. Um, it's that energy that you can use as a marker to identify your strength. So I suppose we don't know what our strengths are. We're too afraid to kind of lean into them. A problem seems more urgent. We're programmed to be vigilant for problems as well. So again, if a weakness is seen as a potential problem, there's this culture of, well, we need to fix that. If you overcome the weakness, you'll succeed more. When actually, it's not about your weakness because my weakness might be someone else's strength and your strength is going to overcome that. So we have to really sort of shift that mindset that it's about leaning into our strengths as opposed to overcoming the weakness. And then the final piece, which is kind of linked into it all, we have this sense that overcoming our weakness 
is the biggest opportunity for growth rather than just leaning into our strength. Um, and I think that's really core to increasing your confidence in an organization. So if an organization can have a culture that's really helping their teams and their employees recognize their strengths, celebrate their strengths, and I suppose put them in roles and projects that are using their strengths, not only will the individual flourish and feel like energized and feel motivated and feel like they're doing the right thing, but the organization is also going to flourish because they're going to have a team of people who are moving forward and are using the right skills to do that. So I hope that makes sense, but it, it does. For me, increasing confidence comes down to tuning into our strengths and, and really, really utilizing them. It really does. And thank you all so much. Um, I suppose just as we're waiting for the Q&A box to, 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 to fill up, I suppose one observation for myself, you know, over the last 50 minutes or so is that we spoke about those entering the workplace. We spoke about those returning to the workplace. What about those who are leaving the workplace, particularly those who are coming down, I suppose, the home straight in their careers and those who've been in the workplace, you know, for the full duration of their life and they're coming towards retirement age. And um, so, Karen, I'm going to come to you on this one and put you on the spot. Um, and I suppose just ask you how we can support those who are feeling vulnerable, how we can identify those who are feeling vulnerable and um, who are coming towards the end of their careers. And, and in particular, I'm talking about all levels of the organization and um, leaders have a tendency to, to put up a greater front uh, and cover their vulnerability, um, you know, more than a lot uh, within the workplace. So how do we actually facilitate those who are leaving the workplace and um, alleviate their vulnerability? Yeah, I suppose, I suppose like with somebody who's been in a company for a very long time, they um, would have very different feelings as they come to the end of their, their tenure. Um, you know, they would be feeling particularly vulnerable. They may um, be thinking forward, hopefully to be financially stable, that that might be a vulnerability that they may have. Um, and they may, you know, have a lack of um, of, of um, direction. What are they going to do? Um, they they may have no plans. They, you know, so, so I think um, getting support for, for those people is, is really important. And um, like what Laura does as a coach um, is fantastic. And I have great faith in, in life coaches and career coaches uh, and th their life coaching career coach are really important through every stage of your life you know so even if you are hitting retirement age uh, it's just as important to have some kind of plan moving forward or else it just all goes to mush you know so um you know you know i'm sure that laura offers that as well and as, as she said herself a lot of the coaching that she does for mums is completely transferable um so she would be talking about looking at your strengths what are you going to do do you, what do you love you know, what have you what have you always wanted to do like and is that possible to do now and putting a plan into place and you can still have five year ten year plans you know but sometimes you just need somebody to shape, help you shape that uh, as you move forward and that's where that's where coaches really do come into their own and um, help you discover what's in yourself so that it's all there you know but you just might realize it or you might be a bit um, fuzzy in your thinking but um, the, the coaches will help you get that clarity and help you plan a future. So that's, that's what I would do. Thanks so much, Karen. C can I ask you to, I suppose, quickly double down on that, Laura? I presume as a coach, you would see, I suppose, a lot of people coming to you who would wrap their identity up um, in their work life um, and I suppose have a, a, a severe emotional attachment to it. Um, can you just give us, I suppose, further insights to the question? Yeah, well, what you're talking about there, the, the idea of someone maybe approaching retirement or even not approaching retirement, maybe just leaving an organization they've been in for 15 years. And it's, it's no different to what happens a woman when she becomes a mom. So your life as you know it is about to change. Your way of doing things are about to change. Your values and your belief system may change. So yes, I do this with moms all the time, helping them make that transition to motherhood and beyond. But as Karen said, it's transferable to everyone. And it is very much about taking a step back, like the work I do is all about clarity. I use clarity a lot. It's getting clarity on what exactly is going on in my life right now. Am I happy with it? What would I like it to be? Where's the gap? And how do I do it? That's a very simplified way of doing it. But the reality is your life is within your control, but you can't control it or change it unless you've clarity on what it is you want and what needs to happen. So it is like everything I talk about is transferable. It's transferable to a teenager, to someone in their 50s. It's, it's about stepping back and deciding I want to take control. And while this massive life transition might be happening and it's going to feel scary and it's going to feel different, 
that is one element of my life. So it's back to what I was saying about the stool and balance. Your career is one element of your life. We need to look at all the elements to make sure you have a balanced life that you're happy with. Does that make sense in any way? It certainly does, you know, and I think that we've looked at the, I suppose, the full journey of the worker from entry in work, re-entry to work and um, the exit from the workplace. Uh, I think it, it's it's a good time, I suppose, to call a halt to proceedings and um, given the time time is actually getting quite short towards the end. So I think that's all we have time for, but look, I sincerely like to thank our panellists here um, for, you know, what was an incredible hour, fantastic insights, really passionate about, I suppose, the topic and your own areas of work. Um, and I've no doubt the audience, you know, have, have reaped severe um, value from what you all spoke about in the last hour. And once again, once again, on behalf of Deloitte, um, I'd like to thank you all for attending and thank IT Cork for the opportunity. I'm wishing you all a, a lovely afternoon. Thank you all again. Thank you.